Sports cards are back. People are buying and selling cards with enthusiasm not seen since the heyday of collecting in the 1980s. I think what you're seeing right now across the industry is one of the most healthy and vibrant um, times that we've seen for our industry. It's tough to pass on the money to be made right now. 2020 has seen record-breaking numbers for cards sold at public auctions. Over 10 have sold for $500,000 or more. We sold a Mike Trout card limited to one, the Super Fractor, for $3.9 million. These are the two most expensive basketball cards in the world uh, that have publicly traded. The resurgence has been building over the last several years, largely driven by those in their 30s and older who collected as kids and are now adults with income to spare. We all had this like crappy experience of the card companies flooding the market and then our cards being worthless. But you fast forward 30 years, you kind of have a remembrance and nostalgia for um, how fun that was. With the onset of the pandemic, card collecting exploded. And now Wall Street and Silicon Valley are taking notice. What we have never had in the business are wealth managers money managers, hedge fund guys, alternative investment funds. And so what we've been doing is just buying the best of the best. You know, we created a $20 million fund. Card collecting is different from what it was 40 years ago, but the crash of the 90s is still haunting. Card makers and collectors are determined to avoid repeating their mistakes and cash in on this popular alternative asset. You know, I think cards are, are definitely having a moment, but you know, if you take a long-term view of this, you know, the, the cards are here to stay from a, from a, as an asset class. If you were a kid growing up in the 80s and 90s, more than likely you collected baseball cards, and your father told you they'll one day be worth a lot of money. That's because your father saw his card collection from when he was a kid become valuable in the 1970s, when a generation of boys came of age and rediscovered their card collections. For example, in the late 1960s, a 1952 Topps Mickey Mantle card, considered one of the greatest vintage cards of all time, was worth about a dollar. A decade later, it was worth about $1,000. In 2006, a near-perfect version of this card sold for near $283,000. And in 2018, a similar card sold for just shy of $2.9 million at auction. A lot of people, you know, my age in their mid-40s, um, you know, we grew up in the 1980s and the baseball card boom and going to going to shows. So there are a lot of uh, a lot of adults out there now in, in my age range that grew up, uh, you know, collecting baseball cards and enjoying it, having fun with it. It's difficult to put an exact value on the card industry at its height, but David Liner of the Tops Company says around its peak in 1991, sales were between one and two billion dollars in a given year. What's hard is if you look back at the late 80s and the early 90s, it was really a boom about baseball cards. It was less so about the NBA, NFL, and the NHL, which today are much bigger properties. And then the industry crashed. All the cards 90s kids collected, worthless. That bubble was driven by oversupply. Um, well, restricted supply initially, and then it burst when the company said, you know what? We're gonna make two million of these Ken Griffey rookie cards, but tell people that it was much fewer. Most of my friends, you know, were same similar ages in the 30s, 40s. Like our collections are frankly worthless from that period of time, and and that that's why it's the card companies. About 20 years later, those same kids grew up and began revisiting their old card hobby. In 1996, that's when the junk wax era, the mass production era ended. 1996 was the first year where they really started serializing our, uh, cards, and you started getting real scarcity. The reason that's really important is the people who grew up in 1996, they were about eight to 10 years old collecting, now they've reached disposable income, right? So all the cards that I wanted when I was a kid that I couldn't afford, now that I'm working and I have some disposable income, people like me are like, I want to go and finally buy that. The industry had seen some major changes. In the late 1990s, card grading became popular. For a fee, companies like PSA, Beckett, and SGC rate cards on a scale of 1 to 10, taking into account the quality and rarity of the card. The higher the grade, the higher the value. It's a commodity. People know the general range when an aid is going to go for, and it allows a lot of people to buy and sell trading cards sight unseen. That changed the industry more than anything else. When I was a kid, grading wasn't a thing. Like you'd walk into a card shop or a card show and you know buy raw cards, which just means you know cards that were pulled out of a pack and they're in some little penny sleeve or whatever. You know, I got cards graded in the late 90s when I was a teenager, you know, when these companies were just getting going. 
the concept of having a official grade, you know, like it's mint or it's gym mint, whatever, and that it's authentic, I think is very critical. The card makers went through consolidation and sports leagues signed exclusive deals with one card company. Today, Topps produces cards for Major League Baseball. Panini has the rights to the NBA and NFL, and the NHL is signed with Upper Deck. These brands further increased exclusivity by offering limited edition cards, better known as hit cards. Finding a rare card that includes an autograph or a piece of a player's jersey could instantly be worth five or more figures. All of the manufacturers, we are all well aware of what happened in the 80s and 90s and not wanting to repeat those mistakes. Our licensors, Major League Baseball, the NFL, NBA, they are all well aware also. It's not over licensed. For the most part, we're able to manage within our lane of those four licenses to ensure that we're creating great products that will resonate for years to come. In the early 2010s, breaking started to gain a following online. It offsets risk when buying unopened cards and has amassed a following on YouTube and Twitch. Say a box that sells for $500 and you've got 10 packs in the box. So people can buy slots in that box and say everybody can buy a pack. And the person opens up, okay, this pack is for this person. Got Brian H. Padres, Michael S. Nationals, Cameron M. Royals, Michael C. Rays. And it's all done online. It's all done in front in front of the camera. And you don't know what you're going to get. You know you're going to get a pack in that box. So somebody may get something worth $25. Somebody may literally get something worth $50,000. Logo man, patch auto, one of one. Luka Doncic. Boom! Dude, somebody has to get rich on the stream. Breaking to the trading card community is our version of esports, and it, it, it's great. And everybody, you know, everybody I know loves it. After an injury landed Rich Layton at home for an extended period of time, he rediscovered his card hobby and stumbled upon breaking. Having collected since I was a kid, and cards had changed a bit. I saw a relic of, uh, I got a relic card with a piece of game used jersey inside of it. I received an autograph card in the box, and I was blown away. Uh, those things did not exist in the uh, mid to late 80s when I was collecting when I was younger. One thing led to another. This took me onto YouTube. I even came across a couple of people who called themselves breakers. And I saw their videos and I thought to myself, man, I, I feel like this is something that I can do well. Rich founded Layton Sports Cards in 2012 and has been breaking cards ever since. The company has 11 full-time employees, boasts one of the top YouTube channels for breaking with over 30,000 subscribers and nearly doubled their sales each year since the start. The jump from 2019 to 2020, this current year, we're expecting to double our sales again. This year, we have not stopped. Uh, demand for our breaks and the demand for products and the demand for uh, just sports cards in general on all markets and all facets of the industry is, has never been better, at least since, since we started in 2012. It's never been better. This past decade, people in the sports card world noticed a significant increase in value and demand. I noticed the industry really taking off in 2016. We really noticed a giant jump in doing the amount of breaks and doing the amount of product uh, really in the beginning of 2017. The trading card business has been growing significantly the past five or six years. What we've seen in the last six months during the pandemic has been an acceleration of that growth. People are stuck at home and looking for things to do. So they're getting back into, you know, maybe hobbies or interest of theirs and collections. There's no sports on TV at the time and they're not spending time uh, or money on, you know, going out to dinner or going on vacations at that time. So it looks like more people were putting their money into, into collectibles and into their hobbies. I mean, heading into before COVID, if you will, in January and February of this year, we were hitting record numbers for our business already. When COVID started and people had to stay home, we took off even more from there. In a pandemic, you'd think that business would be slow. And right now it's the best it's ever been. Obviously we would rather have a healthy country, but you know, we're here to take advantage of it as much as we possibly can. But overall, I would say the market, whether it's a card, an autograph, game used jersey, bat, things have gone up a lot. Then ESPN moved the release date of the hotly anticipated Michael Jordan documentary series, The Last Dance from June to April. The Last Dance was a, a very well-timed documentary, you know, released when we were all starved for sports. Uh, you know, there was nothing. 
you know, 20 plus years removed from Jordan's kind of like, you know, his last three-peat in 97. Putting a lot of his highlights out there and kind of reinvigorating the debate, is he the greatest of all time? And this is LeBron James, but I think The Last Dance brought a lot of nostalgia back and, and really um, uh, showed a new generation how significant Jordan was to, to the game of basketball. The Last Dance became the highest rated documentary in ESPN history. It brought back nostalgia, it brought back memories of the greatness of Michael Jordan and his cards and memorabilia started going up. And in our industry, it is definitely a case where rising tides lift all boats. If a Michael Jordan rookie goes from 40,000 to 100,000, then you know Charles Barkley rookies are gonna go up, Kobe Bryant rookies are gonna go up, LeBron James rookies are gonna go up, Steph Curry rookies are gonna go up, and so on and so forth. Sales of Michael Jordan cards on eBay increased over 370% after the film's release, and eBay has seen an average of three basketball cards sold every minute on the platform. Out of all the stuff that's seen significant increases in 2020 and that we handle, uh, Michael Jordan's percentage-wise has seen the most. In the months after the release of The Last Dance, several basketball cards sold for six figures or more at auction. Two of them, a LeBron James rookie card and a Giannis Antetokounmpo rookie card for $1.8 million each. The buyer, Lear Avidar and Alt Fund One. For the fund, try to get really good lighting. This, this is the multi-million dollar LeBron card that we purchased. This is the best LeBron card. And then, and this is obviously our, our favorite card. This is the Giannis card. These are the two most expensive basketball cards in the world uh, that have publicly traded. How much are we holding in your hands right now? I would say well over $5 million, at least in today's market value. I mean, people have been speculating that this one is already in itself worth over $5 million. Lear Avidar has been a collector most of his life, owning some of the most valuable Kobe Bryant cards. I am a Kobe collector like through and through. So my collection is like 99% Kobe Bryant. I would say, I think I have the, the most high-end Kobe Bryant collection in the world. For years, he's believed sports cards are part of the modern age of alternative assets or culture assets. A culture asset, there's three things that go into it. So the first is there's nostalgia associated with it, right? Like I grew up collecting Kobe Bryant. I feel attached to him. I really want something that I can be part of his brand. The second one, these things are really made very well. It's, you know, it's a great picture. It's a great pose. It is a piece of art. And then the last part is like, it is an appreciating asset given the scarcity of these assets. And so together you get this magical thing called what I, again, as I said, a culture asset. With greater awareness of inventory, limited edition cards, and a formal grading system, this new era of card collecting proved select cards could be a serious way to diversify one's investments. Back when cards were $5, like it was hard to kind of, you physically had to have many of them to have any sort of value, valuable collection. Nowadays, you can have 10, 20 cards and have a significant portion of your net worth in sports cards as an alternative asset. And so I think there's also people treating it as like a long-term investment. One of the things that we hear constantly is that people appreciate people like the idea that these collectibles are tangible they can get uh, an item they can hold it they can enjoy it they have some safe store of value and they get a little bit more than they would out of the company's stock babe ruth isn't going to do anything tomorrow that's going to hurt the value of his collectibles on the financial side of things i think we've had such a bull run over the last 10 years that people are looking to diversify their assets and also to just find ways to make more yield uh, or just return you know the stock market over the long run makes around seven percent People want to take a lot more risk, especially early on uh, when they're young. And so you're finding people thinking about, okay, I guess I can make 7% in the stock market, but where can I make 100%? Where can I make, you know, this is why cryptocurrency became really big. And so you're seeing people start speculating. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of people move into alternative assets because again, they want to make those higher returns. For Lior, he saw this trend and realized there was no way for people to manage and track the value of their alternative investments. So he founded Alt. I've been investing in alternative assets now heavily since 2016, and I've basically run into all these problems at scale. And so Alt is really a solution to all those problems. So the first problem that people run into is, what is my asset worth? And so you can put in a card and they'll tell you exactly how much it's worth. So you can see everything all in one place. It feels very much like fidelity. The second problem is around insurance. These are hard assets, right? So we've created a dynamic insurance product where you can upload your collection, 
mostly you're just managing it, but you click insure and you're always insured up to the alt value, which is kind of like our proprietary Zestimate or Kelly Blue Book. Uh, and then the last piece is around liquidity. And so for the first time, you can actually take a loan against your entire collection. Not only did Lior create the platform, but he also created Alt Fund One, a $20 million investment fund for sports cards. The fund has already purchased over 100 cards and is up 35% since September. We are creating a diversified portfolio of, I would say, 75% basketball, 25% football. Uh, there are some speculative bets in there, as well as people who have already hit their career accolades like Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant. Uh, majority of the portfolio is buy and hold, but 25% is actually for arbitrage. So given that we are the best at valuing the assets, uh, I would say we are in prime position to find something that we can quickly buy and sell or trade uh, and make some good money off. Alt Fund One is only available to accredited investors, but other companies like Collectible and Rally allow individuals to purchase shares of cards and collectibles. Lear hopes to securitize the fund so people can trade it like a fund on the New York Stock Exchange and one day display the cards to the public. So here's one more card that we have not disclosed publicly that we just purchased, which is uh, the 2011 Bowman Chrome Mike Trout Super Fractor. So there is one of this in the world. It is rookie card as well and if you're investing in the fund you get to own own this card with us the sports card industry is hot and it seems everyone is profiting to some degree our sales in 2019 were 27 million and our sales for 2020 will top 100 million our auction sales uh, for sports in 2019 were just over 70 million we're poised to do over 85 million in sales 2020, just in auctions alone and sports. An increase of at least 30 to 50 percent. You know, when you look at a high end card that was worth a thousand, now it's 20,000. I mean, that's a lot more. Collectors and industry experts believe this era is different from the 1980s and 1990s. It's a pure market. Um, it's, it's just, it's pure um, supply and demand. What I can tell you at Tops is the demand today is so far ahead of the supply. We're a made to order business. So we start producing our products months in advance. And when the demand is super, super high, we never go back on press and make more product. And even though sports are back, card collecting is not stopped. There's even a strong chance the most valuable card record will be broken in the near future. I can tell you this, the Luka Doncic logo men just sold privately for $3.2 million that not a lot of people know about. So they're accelerating pretty quickly. I will say we will see our first $10 million card in the next two years. There's no market that's just going to only uh, only go up. And so are there going to be corrections in this market? I, I suspect there will like any other, but I don't think um, I don't think that the corrections are going to be uh, as significant as they will be in, in more traditional markets. Whether you are an investor, collector, or breaker, it's a good time to be in the business of small pieces of cardboard. It's always hard to say, where does this industry go? The pandemic has definitely helped um, have a step change in the growth. And I think as long as the manufacturers do a good job of creating products with value that are high quality, that resonate with consumers, I think we'll do a much better job of sustaining this growth uh, for many years to come. There aren't as many shows as there used to be in the 80s or as many brick and mortar stores, but the shows that are left and the brick and mortar stores that are, are left are using the digital platforms to involve um, the same amount of people, if not more people, that were involved in this hobby uh, in previous generations. So uh, all those things are coming together to really make it a, a vibrant and good market. But I think it really trades back to this, you know, just cycle of collecting. Like, you know, things become vintage every year. You know, 30, 25, 30 years ago, whatever was produced then is now vintage. And it, it cards isn't, they aren't immune to that. You know, the cards that you're opening today with your son or daughter, like that I'm opening, like I can't imagine they'll be worth anything in 20 years, but they probably will be. So keep them.